happy Sabbath to you. Thank you for the uh, song, Sylvia and David. We really appreciate uh, your participation in the service. Um, when, when the offering took place, always Glee was in the back and he was doing the offering, right? You remember? Even when he was walking uh, very hard, he was still doing that. He always, when he was here, he was doing that. Thank you, Bula, for being here. Today, I want to go straight in scripture and start from the text that we just have as scripture reading. Just bear with me for a second. The text says that Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So the question for today it's a simple question. Did God call you to follow him? And if he did, what are some of the objective that God is looking for? Let's say, are you considered that following Jesus is an easy thing? It, is Jesus too nice to you and say, well, you know, do whatever you want it and, you know, as long as you say that you are following me, you'll be okay. Now, the first question that we have to ask is, why God needs disciples? Why Jesus needed disciples? Wasn't he having all the power in heaven? Was not he that had power in his words? Why he needs disciples? Not only that, but he, he needed disciples not for a day, not for a week. He needed disciples for a long time. That's three years and a half. It's like going to college. You remember, you know, some people you remember that time. You go very enthusiastic, you know, the first day, and then exam are coming and, and papers and learning and struggle. The same happened to the disciples too. They enter in the service, but they enter in the service for a specific reason. Uh, just uh, if you have a Bible, we'll, we'll read multiple texts today. So if you can just follow the, the scripture with me. In Matthew chapter 4, and here is verse 18. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Gray, uh, Galilee, saw so two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you, what? He didn't say, I'll follow you, just disciple, just stay, you know, just learn the philosophy and, and the teaching that I have, and you spread the teaching. Many people think that, you know, being a disciple of Jesus is just a learning experience. What Jesus said, that to be a disciple of Jesus, it's an activity. It's on doing something. It's not just sitting uh, in the chairs, comfortable, and somebody is coming and presents you a lesson. Amen. Jesus called with his disciple to do something. And that's what? To catch, catch men. Right? Because that's exactly, as a fisherman, you catch fish. And if you say fishermen of men, that means that somehow you have to have a net. Can I, can I go what you need to have? You have to know to swim because you'll be in the water most of the time. You have to have a boat because when the storm comes, the water is getting in the boat and you need to follow your skills of swimming to the shore. When we visit the Sea of Galilee, I was looking around, and you can see the shore from one shore from the other, and I was, is my challenge, it's like, a, I was looking, I said, oh yeah, I can just, you know, swim across and just come back. I, I, I think that, you know, if I would stay there for a long longer time, I would like to do that. But then I learned something. 
the, there were two mountains in the, in, in, in the la, north side, not uh, west side. And the wind is coming through those two mountains and hits the, that sea so hard that the, the winds are making big waves. And that's exactly what happened to some of the disciples, if you remember. They were skilled in doing something, working, catching fish. And God called them to catch men. But Jesus said, if you follow me, you have to bear your cross. See, it's easy to follow Jesus when you don't have to do anything. Especially when you use your lips as attachment to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. But just, just a page from that, chapter 5, verse 20. God called his disciple not only to be a fisherman of man, but he said in verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceed, what? The righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, we know that we have a very bad view of Pharisees and Sadducees. And not because of anything else, but Jesus himself made very bad remarks toward the Pharisees and Sadducees. But he said, if your righteousness is not exceeding, who is righteousness today? Ah, oh, your pastor, your leader, somebody that's moving in the church and is doing something? Maybe you just, you have to look around, right? But it's like, a, what kind of standard of righteousness is? It's a human righteousness? Is that something that you, you like to be? Because what Jesus said, that's not enough. And we tend to just follow John's everywhere. Is that battle, you know, they have this, I'll have it. They do this, I'll do it. To understand that, we have to go to the end of the chapter where Jesus said, therefore, verse 48, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven. It's perfect. Jesus starts with his disciples saying, yes, look around. You have the Pharisees and their righteousness. They keep the law, they keep the forms. He's not saying, oh, don't do that. You know, Jesus said, do what they are saying, not what they are, they are doing, right? It's like a, because, you know, they, they were just saying things and doing something else. But what Jesus is saying, that's their standard of what they call righteousness. Here's the righteousness that I'm calling you to. Infinity. God. Now, you may say, oh, that's, that's easy because I will just claim Jesus' righteousness and I have it. Yeah, in a way, that's true. But it's more than claiming. It's an action. It's not just a statement. Too many of us, so we may consider that we are this disciple of Jesus because we're baptized in the church, we are brought in the church, we live in the church, our life is in the church. But what means to be a disciple of Jesus? Still in Matthew, chapter 18. Matthew, chapter 18. And here's verse 3. Well, I'll say uh, verse 2 so that we, we get the, the idea here. Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, I surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will be by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, that takes me by surprise because I thought that I should just compete with the Pharisees. But see, Jesus is bringing something else in the discussion. It's not the Pharisee that we have to follow. It's the little child. It must be that Jesus wants to talk to us, like to his disciple, and say, your example are not the Pharisees. 
Yeah, they do, you know, great things when it comes to the law. But look, what was so special about the child? Ah, oh, we have the kids right here, right? And they may say things that are very honest, right? That we will not dare to say it in the public. They do that. They have the beauty of untainted character. That's exactly what a disciple of Jesus is supposed to be. Honest, truthful, faithful, believing. Oh, you try to just, uh, you know, put, put the kid on top of a, a mount of snow and say, jump, daddy will catch you. See what happens. He'll jump. He'll not just have a second thought. He'll not say, I'm not sure. May I ask mom? No, they will jump. Let the Lord talk to you and say, jump and see what happens. Oh, Lord, let me see. I don't know. And, uh, I think that there is a verse here that says that I may have to think twice. Are you using the scripture to not do what Jesus is asking you to do? Why Jesus needed disciples? Still a matter. I like Matthew for a certain reason today. But it's like a Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chap chapter 13 is presenting a situation when Jesus brings to his disciples a notion that they are special people. Okay, so you are special people when you declare yourself a disciple of Jesus. Verse 10. It says, and the disciple came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parable? So the disciple came to Jesus because, let me say that, why you are not speaking, speaking in plain English? That's pretty much what they said. Why, why are you talking about parables to people? Now you want to find the answer because that's, that's directed to his disciple and to those that call themselves disciples. He says, verse 11, because he has been given to whom? To you, to know what? The mystery of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it was not given. Now, there is no plain text like this ever in the scripture because what it says, the disciples were entrusted with mysteries that nobody else knew about it. We have that text that uh, spiritual things should be judged spiritually. That means it's like a, a lot of people have their Bibles and I know a lot of people they have multiple types of Bibles. Maybe some uh, have more translation of the Bible in their library than most of us. But they still have problem understanding the mystery of heaven. Why? Because God is not giving them that. As a disciple of Jesus, you have the key to the mystery of heaven. I know, maybe it scares you. Oh, I don't know. Or some people will take it. Oh, now I know something. I'm more smarter than you. If he, Jesus will come today and will say to you, please follow me and be a fisherman of men. My, 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 my first question will be, Lord, what that entitles? What shall I do, right? Do, do you think that, you know, when God is asking you to become a disciple, you have the right to say, um, can I have the contract and see what it is so I can sign on? Uh, let's look at Mark. Mark chapter 10. Here verse 13. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. So it's uh, oh, Matthew, still in Matthew, 13. And here, 
Verse 10. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I got, yeah. Luke chapter 9. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm in the right place. Sorry. I can hear the pages turning, so that's a good thing. Now it happened, as they journeyed in the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nothing to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go and bury my father first. Uh, 57, now I'm in, in 60. So it's a chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 60 right now. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their dead, on dead, and you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid uh, them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said, no one having put his hand on the plow, look it back, it's fit for the kingdom of God. So what God is looking is looking for commitment. If you are a disciple, you should just be a disciple. See, the Super Bowl is tomorrow, right? And people are just buying jersey, like a $150 jersey, so that they will have their own team on it. And you know, by the time that the, the game starts, few hours prior that they sit right there and just talk about the game. There may be some, you know, fighting at the stadium usually after the game. Why? Because people, they are very staunch, you know, fan of, of the certain teams. Are you the same way when it comes to faith? Or is it a kind of, oh, it doesn't matter. Are you standing up and say, Lord, please, I want to follow you. Not only that, but in this text, there are two types of people. Do you see the two types of people? There are those people that Jesus invited them to follow him, and those people that are saying, can I go with you? Now, why is that important? Because during the John the Baptist time, a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees were coming and try, you know, they were baptized, right? They were just saying, you know, mitigate the future. It's like a, you know, who knows? Maybe John the Baptist is right. Why not just having the baptismal too? And John the Baptist was very harsh on them. Called them brood of vipers. Because he said, who teach you to run from what is coming? Because fear makes people, well, it's helping people to make some decision for their own salvation, thinking that that will be safe for them. Are you disciple of Jesus because of this? Or because what he is putting in front of you, that's the perfection that we should have like the Father. See, there is a cost if you are a disciple of Jesus. You have to leave your family. Uh, so much so that one time, Jesus' mother, you remember Jesus' mother? She was always with Jesus. We know that his father passed away. And Mary was staying with Jesus. And during his three and a half years, she was his shadow. But one day, few of Jesus' brothers and his mother came when he was preaching. And they said, well, just come out. And they said, we want to talk to you. And somebody goes there, your mom and your brothers outside wants to talk to you. You know what Jesus said? My brothers, my mom, are those that are doing the will of God. Discipleship is not based on DNA. It's based on faith. That's what truly is the bottom of being a disciple. I grew up, you know, I'm what you call a third generation Adventist. 
And I was uh, 14, I had some people in my class, those good guys that are always there to help you. And they said, of course you are an Adventist because your parents are Adventists. Oh, I took it hard on my heart. You know what I did? I beat them up. No. <laughs> See, it's like it. <laughs> See, that's, that's a human nature. We, we, you know, it's like a revolt against it. No. I went to all the churches in town to find out what they believe so I can compare it. Can I choose to be an Adventist? I choose to be an Adventist. It was not because of my DNA. It helped to be. It helped to have my family. But my choice was to be an Adventist because of what I understand. I think that's something we have to teach our kids to do too. Because too many times the adults are making choices and then suddenly they find with all foundation and they are blown away by, by the world. Being a disciple of Jesus imply cost. Now, let's say that I'm looking, we don't have the numbers that in the scripture, but let's say that in a church you have 82 people, members. Are you ready for this? 82 members. Disciple of Jesus. 82. And suddenly 70%, 70 people are leaving the church. They walk to the door, you know, like, hey, that's, that's it for us. What do you think that will be your assessment of that leader of that church? Oh, I'm telling you, you, you will not be happy. Most of the time, we we'll rather wait and listen to the 70 and change our ways than to let them go. Let's look in John chapter 6, because that's exactly the story. See, you thought that I'm talking about a certain church. Yeah, I was talking. But this is about the disciple of Jesus. You remember when Jesus had 82 disciples? He sent them to preach the gospel. Now, inside of Jesus' disciples, there are different circles, right? You have the three well, I would say John was the, the first one, right? Because he always have a way to stay on Jesus' chest. Somehow he was that close to Jesus, physically. He always stayed next to Jesus. But then you have the three people, right? Peter, John, and James. That was the first group of Jesus. He invited them to pray for him in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And you can see that always he, he will... They were the first one that were able to understand Jesus better. Because they were there. Jesus was talking to them. And then they have different group of people. So when you have 82, it must be that, you know, that group was a little bit larger. Why the 70%, 70 people leave Jesus? Well, let's look. John chapter 6, and here's verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Who? His disciples. They didn't want to walk with Jesus anymore. So the question is, what was his problem? What was their problem? Well, to find out, we have to just go back. And we have to go back to verse 48. Verse 48 says, I am the bread of life. You fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are, what, dead. They are dead. Oh, you thought that if you are eating manna, you'll stay forever? Live forever? See, eternity, life, eternity, is not in the bread. It's in Jesus. You remember what he said to the uh, Pharisees? You read the scripture thinking that you have eternal life. But it's me, Jesus said. 
He is the eternal life. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, and he's referring to him. That one may eat, and he will not die. You want not to die? Okay. So let's, you know, Jesus is saying, it's in my Bible's read the uh, red letter, right? So it's like, a, you know, it must be that it kind of clear that that's Jesus' word. Let's study more. I am the living bread, verse 51, which come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live, how long? Forever. And the bread that I shall give is what? Okay, here, he, we lose some people here, some disciples, we'll, we'll, we'll lose them right there, because it says, the bread that I shall give you is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. All right, so, so let's read more because this is important for us. The Jews therefore quarrel among themselves, say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat, especially if you are vegetarian? <laughs> oh, you didn't get that. It's like, it's like, oh, so not only that I have to eat meat, but I have to eat Jesus? See, that, that's, the, that's the problem. But here's what's happening. Verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Is that tough for you? Because it's tough for me. Every time we have communion, we get lost. Most of people don't want to have communion because it's like, well, it's like, well, let's not go in there. But he's like, what you are saying, Jesus, is I should eat your flesh and drink your blood? Uh, yeah, I know some people that are still on this earth that are doing that, but not me, Lord. Whatever, 54. Whatever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. You want to have eternal life? And I will raise him up in the last days. No, that's interesting because eternal life doesn't mean that you have it after you are dead. Eternal life is now. Amen. He's talking about having eternal life now. We don't understand how eternal life is when you die. But God has a way to keep his people still alive when they are dead. Now, you, you may have trouble with that. And I understand. You remember when Jesus was talking about the Sadducees because they didn't believe in resurrection? And he said he's like a God, is God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are those people still alive? No. They're dead. But here's what Jesus said. God is a God of the living, not of dead. It must be that we are missing big points when it comes to how God sees us, even in death. My, f 55, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abide in me, and I in him. If they want to have a relationship, that's the relationship. We call that, you know, it's like, I, I was reading Indian, Indian kind of stories when I was a kid. Karmai, Vinetu, they, you know, they were cutting themselves a little bit, the blood, and they would just see blood brothers. That's what you call. What Jesus wants is uh, blood brothers. What he says is like, drink my blood and eat my flesh, and I'll be with you. As the living Father, verse 57, sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, not as your father ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Do you believe that? Because the 70, they got themselves in trouble. Look at verse 60. It says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a harsh saying. Who can understand it? 
When Jesus knew himself that his disciples complained about that, he said to them, do this offend you? Let me, let me ask you this. It's communion offending you. Because that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. What's part of the communion that offends you? I, you know, I can tell you stories. I was one day invited to speak at the communion time. It was a big church. Uh, they said it's like uh, 2,000 members. So uh, we went there to do the communion. I was the invited speaker. So um, the time comes, and when you go to a certain type of churches, you know, the numbers kind of impress you. I was young, and I, I had emotions. So I'm going there, the time comes, I'm looking at the clock, time for me to speak. You know how many people were in that church? 50, five zero. From 2,000 members, I'm not talking about, you know, those people that are part of our families, because as Adventists, we believe the members are the ones that are baptized. We are not talking about members just because they are part of our families. See, we are more stricter than many other churches. And we have just 50 people and 2,000 members church. Why? Well, that's, that's something. Because I asked people, I asked other pastors, I said, what do you do with the communion? They said, Pastor, you never tell them there is a communion. They show up and then suddenly you, you have captive people, right? What? What's your view of a communion? Is communion offending you? Because verse 62 says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? If communion offends you, what about seeing God going up and coming down from heaven? Is that going to offend you? 63, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profit nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now that's a very tough statement. He's talking about his disciples. I'm wondering if you will be today and you will say the same thing, if you will be offended. Because it's about the belief, it's not following Jesus. He says, some of you who do not believe. And then there is this kind of clarification. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who will betray him. There are two types of people here. One, those people that don't believe. They are just go with the, the mass. You see a friend going to a church, you go to a church. He's doing this, you're good at in doing that because it's not your own decision, it's you go with the flow. But when it comes to faith, mm, I don't know. Especially when it comes to go in the community and make disciples. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I go there, should I knock on the door of people? Nah. Should I go and talk to my co-worker about Jesus? No, because policies. Uh, sh when somebody will ask me if I'm a Christian, I'll say, this, yeah, we all have a church and stop right there. What do you do to bring people in your net? Or let me ask you, do you have a net? Because if you are going fishing, you don't have a net. How do you think that you will catch fish? And some people have some holes in their nets so big that you know what happens when you, you pull the net and there are holes in it? You pretty much catch the water. That's the only thing that you catch because it goes through and there is nothing in the net. The fact that you didn't get a, a disciple is not because you did not to fish, it's because maybe you are not preparing enough to have enough tools. You have to have worms if you just fish for it, right? It's like if you, you don't use a net. 
flying fish. It's like you have to have something that will bring them in. Now, Jesus knew exactly who also will betray him. I want to jump to the end of, of the, the story for today. And that's in uh, Luke 22. Luke 22 is presenting us Jesus having the last meal with his disciples. You want to see what Jesus did? Let's say that, you know, there is a time when you have someone that is dear to you. That they will go somewhere far away. Probably will not see them ever. What are you going to do to make that, that moment stay with you? Well, Jesus did the same thing. He said, uh, verse 14, chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 14. When the hour has come, he sat down, sat down, and the 12 apostles with him. How many apostles? 12, okay? Just, I want to just, then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Was Jesus clear that where he's going? I think that he was very clear about it. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he knows that this is the last meal. <clears throat> then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourself. For I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of a vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and saying, this is my body which uh, is given to you for this. Do this in remembrance of me. We, we, you know, it's like I usually will have that on the table. The church will have that. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But, verse 21, behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Now, you know why the disciple was just having trouble to identify the betrayer? Because it was dark in that room. Like, they didn't have electricity. They have just something very small. And I remember when my ma, my grandma, you know, I grew up with my grandma being one of the person that never used electricity. She had it in the house, but she never used it just pearly and she had a lamp and always when you use the lamp you put it here and by two feet it's kind of hard to see or to read because it's not enough light jesus knew his betrayer is there and truly the son of man goes as it has been determined but vow to the man by whom he's betrayed now, I don't know, it's like a, you may, may have other views, but when you are in, in a, a situation that it's a moment in time, you don't want to bring all the problems on the table. Right? It's like a, you, you'd rather say, I'm not going to say anything. I'll just keep it there. Let's have a moment, a good moment. But Jesus did not do that. Because communion, it's a time when the discipleship it's tested. Ah, oh, you thought it's about Judah? Well, we all have Judah among us and in us. We all have. It's about having our plans that are better than Jesus' plan. We always think that we are smarter than Jesus. Because that's exactly what Judah said. It's like Jesus doesn't have the strategy to promote himself. Why not just having the internet and just, you know, doing that? You know, Jesus will be on the market and he will be believed by everyone. We'll have all kind of disciples. Judah was a smart guy. But his plan was not God's plan. But stay there because it's not about Judah. See, I thought it's like a, you know, 
Judah is the person that take communion and run away. Verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may shift you as wet. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I thought it's about Judah only. It's all about the disciples. Verse 23, I'm going back and forth. Verse 23, then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do such a thing, right? Are you asking yourself, am I betraying Jesus? Is the communion offending you? What kind of disciple are you? Or I am. I'm a disciple just, you know, to be in a group, have good time. But then God used communion to open up and display my own character. Now, you may be one of them, right? Or Judah or Peter. I think Jesus prayed for all his disciples. Don't make the mistake that by being part of communion, that you will be one of them, because both of them left Jesus. One return. But I'll say that, it, that there is a big chance that the return could be impossible for some of us. Because when we make the decision to play with the discipleship, it might be that we play, we walk away, and then who knows what happened. Because we don't know ourselves, and God knows us. He knew from the beginning who's who. You think that God knows us? What kind of disciple are you? And what will offend you to leave the church today? It's the communion? Hmm? I'm praying that we can just understand how much the love of God surrounds us and keep us together. Communion, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's a unique thing in Adventism. You know why? Because in our history, I'm pastoring Borderville Church, which is the first church that was built by Seventh-day Adventists, for Seventh-day Adventists. And doing some research, I found out something that kind of took me back. In that time, if you are missing two communions, your membership was taken out. You lose your membership by not being part of communion. And I was struggling with this idea. I said, you know, we, we, it seems to me that that's something you'll not be able to do today for different reasons. But I was, I was doing that and trying to understand why they were doing that. If you are in New York, you have to send a letter and say, I'm in New York at this church. Please excuse me for the communion. That letter will keep you in the box. They were very serious about communion. I see leaders of the church that are not taking communion. You know what the problem is? If you don't experience forgiveness for yourself, it's hard to for forgive other people. How could you lead other people if you are not part of Jesus, right? He said, drink it, eat it, because I'm eternal life. If you are not doing that, what kind of life you have? Not eternal. How could you lead a church if you are an officer and you are not part of the communion? Yeah, we call today the um, uh, uh, regular membership or stand, good standing members, right? And will always refer only to money. Oh, if you pay tithe, you are a good standing. I wish that we can just have a, a spiritual system where if you are part of the communion, if you are part of the forgiveness and that relationship that you show Jesus in humility and service, then that's what I call good 
standing. We should expand that. We should leave communion more than ever. There's some discussion right now that the communion should not be once in the trimester, should be more often. Some people are saying that, no, I don't need it. I need it probably once a year or two. Yeah, I know. It's like, it's not something that, you know, it's in the scripture, right? Jesus didn't say, well, you have to have communion at such and such a time. But when we have it, we should just put every effort to understand and question myself. Am I you? Am I Lord? You remember the disciples? When they find out that somebody is the traitor of their master, they ask, am I one, the one? I'm wondering sometimes how we can just come closer and closer to Jesus when we explain communion. Some of the pains that we have in our church, some of the pains that are in our families, some of the pains that we have it in our own lives could be treated by just being part of the communion in the right way. That's what Jesus is doing. I don't have a, it's like I see, my life, it's pretty much this, right? A mess. And I, I can have multiple pages, okay? But what God is doing every time when you take communion, he's take everything else and just give you a, a white page. Are you believing that? Is communion offending you? Uh, let me ask you, what will offend you to leave the church? Let me, let me say this, nothing should not offend you, should not offend you. Well, I did, did a double negative, right? It's like, so it's like nothing should be offending you when it comes to God. Are you tough? If somebody says something and kind of make you, you know, the rub, rub, rubbing in the right, wrong way, it's like, are you leaving the church because, you know, somebody said a word for you, to you? Keep your seat in the church. Be sure that theology is a biblical theology and you are not double-minded. Be sure that you are not, you know, go with the theology that's new. Be sure that what you believe is exactly what you need to do. You want to follow Jesus. And I guess that every one of us wants to follow Jesus. Be a fisherman of men. And that's my prayer for you. We have the, uh, the food washing. I want to explain it a little bit, like usually I do. Food washing is not a human exercise. It's a spiritual exercise. That means that when you are washing the feet of somebody else, your partner in the food washing, you become Jesus for that person. See, because Jesus showed us that example. You know what is missing in our lives? That humility. And every time that we are coming to communion, that's what many people are not here today. In our churches, everywhere, because I'm not talking about this church per se. Because we think that we are just too proud to be humble. And God is putting us in a position that we should humble ourselves. When you understand why, then you know the other issues will not matter. And then when you understand why you have to take the bread and the juice, that also is essential. Because I want you to experience the eternal life just today. Think about it. You can expect. It's not my promise. It's Jesus' promise. So you have to believe him.